morning. So let's continue with our little study of elliptic uh, equations, even though the word elliptic has not yet appeared. <clears throat> so what did we do? We had a Riemannian manifold for now, which is compact and oriented. So it's a standard assumption. And <coughs> the real space, if you like, is this uh, space of differential forms. where this bundle is a complex vector bundle, which builds uh, the basis of the theory of supermanifolds, as you maybe have heard about. So then the smooth functions are replaced by differential forms in order to get the alternating aspect of fermions. But this is not what we talk about. And then we have some differential operators starting with the most fundamental one, D, and then oh. using the metric to construct D dagger, and then adding them to get the Durham Hodge operator, which is, so to speak, a prototype of Dirac operators, even though Dirac did not construct this one. But it was a slightly different operator. And finally, the Laplacian. So these are first order operators. And they are not symmetric. This is why we did this here. This operator is first order symmetric. In this order, uh, this operator is second order and symmetric. And all of these operators are closable. So this is what we talked about. This means that if I take the graph, let's say uh, we restrict to one, let's say D, and I take the closure, then this is again a graph, and then of an operator I call D bar. And why is this so? I mean, this was one of the exercises I Uh, discussed or mentioned yesterday, assume uh, so we call them alpha, yeah? alpha n um, this is a sequence in lambda m which converges to some alpha. Well this will not remain here it may be something which is merely square integrable. And I assume also that d alpha n, which is still smooth uh, differential form, but again, it may converge to something which I call alpha star, again in lambda 2 of n. If this is the case, then we have to show if alpha is equal to zero, then this implies alpha star 
is equal to zero. This I told you, you should have shown this, is the criterion for, for closability. What it really means is that um, if alpha, alpha star, is an element of the graph of a, um, a linear operator, then necessarily the image of zero has to be zero. And that is the, the most general thing. And so we, uh, we look at Uh, this d alpha n, and then I multiply it with some beta. So I take a beta in lambda m, and then I know there's little space here. By this assumption, this goes to alpha star beta. I, I think I took the round brackets here. This is the scalar product in the Hilbert space because the scalar product is continuous. And now I know that uh, D transpose is D, so I get this here. And now I know that this converges to alpha um, D beta, which by assumption is equal to zero. So alpha star uh, times beta for any beta in lambda m is equal to zero. But lambda m is dense in lambda 2 of m, so this implies alpha star is equal to zero. So what you see here, plausibility is a consequence of the existence of a transposed operator. And so this is true for all differential operators, actually. Yeah? So this is something to remember, true for all differential operators. Very good. So we know that we have closures. So d bar, d transpose bar, d bar, delta bar are well defined. So in some sense, closed operators, closed unbounded operators are the replacement for bounded operators because um, these operators, like this here, maps the domain to the space L2 of M. And this is a Hilbert space in the graph norm. Yeah, this is the important remark we made already yesterday. So this is a bounded operator between different Hilbert spaces, but we put it inside and then we can almost work with it uh, like a bounded operator. But the question now is, um, are these closures self-adjoint. Well, this um, requires symmetry, so these two cannot be self-adjoint, of course, but these are, perhaps. But um, as much as we like self-adjoint operators, I need, uh, it is necessary to point out that this is by no means clear that these operators are actually self-adjoint. Okay? So what uh, have, is it what we have to do here? So the first, this is the first question. The second question is slightly um, more generous. Are there self-adjoint extensions? of, well, let me call this operator A in general. What does it mean? Does there exist an operator, say, A tilde, which is contained in A? 
this has an obvious meaning. The domain of this operator is contained in the domain of this operator, and the values on the smaller domain coincide. So it's an extension. So this was the question for Neumann posed to the physicists, which did not care for the savage jointness at all, because they thought, what we do is something which is well defined. Yeah, so everything what we write down is defined, so then it must be self-adjoint, because if I compute eigenfunction, they are in the domain, which is actually true, but the theory is this here. Now von Neumann made the following beautiful observation. which I encourage you to pursue. Of course, you have to know what to do. So we have this operator, and uh, it is clear that we have this relationship because this operator is symmetric. So the closure, uh, the, the adjoint operator, will contain the domain of this operator, but may not be symmetric, okay? So this is symmetric, usually not. And um, the theorem of von Neumann is the following. Consider one over i times a star on the orthogonal complement, but we have, now we have to be a little careful. So the domain of this operator has a norm which comes from the operator norm. Yeah? So it's the graph norm on this space. Likewise here, here we have the graph norm of A star. So we take this in the graph norm of A star. So if you write out what this means, um, let me call this uh, perhaps sigma. Then sigma restricted to dom A is a self-adjoint involution. If you write it down, it's a triviality, but to see it is, of course, um, a big discovery such that uh, this space, which, uh, no, I don't give it another name. I use this space here. Dom A orthogonal splits into two spaces, N plus plus and minus, and what is it? This is um, um, is the, um, oh, I'll pro let's say it's easier. The projection onto n plus minus is um, sigma plus minus one over two. No? I hope that's correct. So this is so for every involution. This is just an algebraic, little algebraic um, computation. Not difficult at all. And the important conclusion is the following. And A admits self-adjoint self extensions if and only if these two spaces have the same dimension. That means if one is infinite dimensional, then also the other. But if one is zero dimensional, then also the other. 
which means A star is equal to A, which is the condition of self-adjointness. So these are called the deficiency numbers. And in general, you can quite easily find out whether this is true or not. So now we have something comfortable. Uh, remember, <coughs> ah, yeah, I should say something else that um, D anti commutes with epsilon. This is the endomorphism of parity, yeah? so minus 1 to the j on uh, forms of degree j. And then verify that n plus minus equals the kernel. Now my a over there is the d here of d star plus or minus i. Well, I mean, you know, this was the involution, so this is absolutely trivial. Then, epsilon anti commutes with the d star as well. And epsilon of n plus minus is equal to n minus plus. So they must have the same dimension. So then there are self-adjoint extensions. This, of course, uh, convinces a physicist because these things as supersymmetries have a certain, I mean, one aspect of supersymmetries have a certain importance. And so we see without doing anything that the operator D always has self-adjoint extensions. And this does not even need that M is compact. If M is not compact, then you replace lambda by the forms with compact support, and everything can be done as here. So this is always true. And then, even for M not compact, server joint extensions. Now we use the spectral theorem. Yes? So is T necessarily a Riemannian matrix? Yes. No. No, because then the nature of the operator uh, is completely different. I mean, you can do something, but uh, let us keep to the, to the Riemannian case. Okay. Yes? Can you uh, read, um, say again, what do you mean by this uh, orthogonal co co complement in the graph of a uh, star? Uh, so. The operator has a domain. Okay, but I mean, uh, and this domain um, carries the norm of A star. So that means uh, if I have, uh, let's say, some alpha in here, then um, the norm, let's, let me call this the A star norm squared, is the alpha norm squared zero just the norm in the Hilbert space, plus the zero norm of A star alpha. This is a norm on the domain, of course, which makes it a Hilbert space if the operator is closed. This is called the graph norm. Okay. Otherwise, the domain sits in, in the Hilbert space rather strangely. You don't know what it is. But if you put 
the, the norm on it, it is a Hilbert space in its own right with this norm. Yeah? Okay, and so you, the scalar product in order to compute this is th this scalar product. So we take alpha, alpha beta, a star alpha, a star beta. That's the Hilbert. Um, and that must be zero. Um, if one is in uh, the domain of A, and that's the condition, and then you see immediately that this is actually so. So, fantastically, spectral theorem implies that delta is always, under all conditions, self-adjoint extensions. But of course, there may be several. And um, that is very unpleasant for a physicist because this means that he has to make a choice. A choice uh, which he was not aware of, maybe. And so there's some information missing which distinguishes between the self adjoint extensions. Uh, we have also that delta is greater or equal to zero, which means, of course, that delta alpha comma alpha is greater or equal to zero, which is very easily um, derived from the fact that this is d squared. And in this case, there is a special extension, which I just want to mention here without explanation. It's the so-called Friedis extension. So <coughs> you may have an operator D without such a, an anti-commuting involution. And then you are not sure whether D really has a self-adjoint extension. But D squared will always have a self-adjoint extension. Now, so this is the more important thing. This is extremely nice. But now what the physicists really want is that the self-adjoint extension of the operator delta, for example, is the closure. So there's, you do not have anything else to do but to look at sequences where alpha n and d alpha n or delta alpha n converges. This is, then the system is well defined. So you don't need any additional information. And this is, unfortunately, not easy. Yeah, this, um, even though you want to assume this gladly. And let me explain what is really behind this. This is the notion of ellipticity. This is not enough uh, by itself, but it is the main tool. And um, so what we need to understand is a symbolic calculus of linear differential operators. This is, of course, um, a whole lecture series in itself. I just want to give you the, the very basic idea. So let us take a, a very simple model, a, um, a differential operator of order k. And it should map functions in Rm with values in Cn to functions in the same space with, um, well, let's say n1 and n2. Okay. And of course, it should be a linear differential operator. So then we take such a thing, let's say S with compact support, which always will be written like this. And then we can write this um, 
in the way you know. Of course, the standard coordinates here are xi, xm, just to remind you. And then a s at the point x is the sum over all multi, multi indices of lengths less than m. I think you know this from calculus. So you have alpha, alpha 1, alpha m in z plus to the m. And alpha modulus is just the sum. So then we have some endomorphisms indexed by alpha. And then we have the partial derivatives. So I remove this here in order to not to confuse things. D alpha, D x alpha, S at the point x. Okay? This is very simple. A partial differential, linear partial differential operator of order, um, this is of course nonsense, uh, is less or equal to k, the order. <coughs> At most, k derivatives and uh, some coefficients. So these a, alpha, are smooth functions, also with compact support. No, not with compact. This has compact support in Rm with m values in the matrices, complex matrices, um, n1 times n2. And uh, now the um, simple but fundamental idea is to use the Fourier transform on this here. Yeah, so I take the inverse, in, this is a compactly supported smooth function. I take the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform. And then I get the following nice formula. Um, so I use the asymmetric Fourier transform where you don't have 2 pi to the m over 2 on both sides, but on one side you have nothing, on the other side you have this factor. You integrate this over Rm. You get the e to the i x psi is the Fourier variable. And now again, I'm writing to voluminous in various places. So this was an explanation which we can remove. What we mean here is really alpha modulus less or equal to k. And then we get here a x psi to the alpha. Um, and we have to put an i here, i to the alpha, times the Fourier transform of S d psi. So everything is well defined. But now I put the sum inside. Um, uh, could have done this immediately. And then it takes the form 2 pi to the minus m integral over Rm ei x psi. This is the scalar product in Rm. And here's some polynomial in psi. Um, polynomial in psi of order at least say with it, smooth coefficients smooth in x. So this is in principle a very simple thing to do. But our standard question is, um,
solve a s equal t and determine the precise conditions under which such an uh, so, uh, equation is solvable, including the regularity of t and the regularity of s. This is the, the daily work of the person who is doing PDE. And here you ha can have a nice idea, namely assume for, for the moment that this does not depend on x for simplicity, then in fact you can, um, if this is invertible, then you can hope to define an operator like this with a symbol A of Xi inverse. Apply this operator to this thing, then you multiply the symbols if they do not depend on X, and you get the identity. So, the idea is simply if a psi is invertible, well, this may be a little bit too much. It would already be nice if the highest term, the term with alpha modulus equal to k, because the other things are smaller in a sense, or even a sub k equals to the sum of the a, uh, um, a x um, psi, where the modulus of alpha is equal to k, which is called the principal, principal symbol. Well, it turns out that um, this is actually not possible because, in, um, as you can easily see, for psi equals zero, everything will vanish. So, but you think this is a rather mild problem, which I'm not going into. But we should add the restriction for psi not equal to zero. So then we have something interesting, and this is called the class of elliptic operator. And this is true in great generality. Say, on lambda m, any differential operator is called elliptic. If the symbol, and we give it a name now, this is called, because of the Fourier transform, A hat of Xi. Okay, remember the i's which are sitting in here. If and only if A hat of Xi is not, is invertible, this is a matrix of course, for psi not equal to zero. And these uh, operators have a very nice solution theory, which implies in particular that in the case of compact M, they are essentially self-adjoint. Or actually in general for most complete metrics, I mean at least the operators we have in, in mind. Of course, the question is now how to compute the symbol on a manifold. Yeah? So that um, needs a little consideration, but not very much. I mean, you can easily verify. Yes? What you said about the central set is just the symbol already designed in this? No, no. We are not, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about the symbolic calculus. And what I want to point out is the notion of ellipticity. And if you have an elliptic operator, then you have a, uh, a machine which tells you whether this will be essentially self-adjoint or not. 
Essential salvage on is, is a subtle problem. If you change just some tiny detail in your operator, you might lose it. So that's, um, this we should not, it is often, geometers often try to wi uh, wipe this under the rug, which is not fair because it always you need a, a, a detailed proof for it. Sometimes a very difficult one. Okay, what is the symbol? So if A is a differential operator of order K on our space lambda M, I think this is a self-explaining notation. And this formula is very nice. A hat of xi equals the following. So you take a variable t here, and this vari variable arises in the following way. You take this smooth function, f is a smooth function, you apply the operator, and you apply... So this you sh should read as follows. Let me first complete this. f is a smooth function on M, um, okay, and Xi is a tangent vector, t a cotangent vector at the point P. This is the right interpretation. Here we have just said it's a Fourier variable. Actually, what we have to keep in mind is that these two points should be interpreted as a base point and a cotangent vector at this point P. This is the right interpretation. And so we do this here, and then we develop, um, we have the point P in here, and for clarity, you can write it like this. But it would be enough here to write this at the point P. What does it mean? I mean, this is a differential operator, this is a differential operator, this is a differential operator, just multiplication. Yes? What? Oh, yeah, this, this is missing. Now we can write this in front. Because if I differentiate, there come these, uh, at most, k powers, and of course, then it should converge, and therefore, we, this is um, a very nice um, remark, and uh, the relation is this one. df should be xi, so this is the invariant transcription, and this is the very nice formula, and you can apply this in this case, and you see, you see that you immediately get what we have done there. So this somehow enacts the Fourier transform. Sorry, question. So this, this K, uh, yes? how is it defined? Or, uh, well, I do not want to define it. Okay. I give you examples. Okay. I mean, in general, you take endo smooth endomorphisms and a covariant derivative. And you take all kinds of polynomials and add them up. This is, the, this is the correct definition, but it's a bit clumsy to write. I mean, you have the uh, examples of these basic operators. I think this is, this is really enough for the moment. But there's a perfect definition. This you can find with something we should have in our list of references. Um, uh, what is the title again? I forgot. The Iraq operators? Hmm? Heat kernel. Heat kernel, right. Thank you. The heat kernel and Dirac operators. So this is a very nice book, but not easy to read. So not only because of um, mistakes which are occurring here and there, but the, uh, they jump um, between subjects but the standard is very high and it's very good. 
Okay, so they explain all this, including what uh, differential operators are in general. So what we want uh, to have is the notion of ellipticity, and so we apply this to our operators. Let's say we want to compute um, D at some point. So we follow this recipe. So first of all, we need T inverse, E to the minus I T F of Xi, F of X, F, um, or F of, um, let's put it the at the end, and we put P here, F is a smooth function as above DF at the point P is equal to Xi. So what happens? Well, the best thing to compute this here, we recall our formula apply to e to the i t f times. Um, now this is an operator, yeah. So I have to apply the whole thing to some form. And what um, happens? So the Covariant derivative is a derivation, so it goes, falls on here times alpha, and this times the derivative of alpha. So if, if I derive the alpha, then the 1 over t will kill what I have there. So I can uh, drop this, and, and I write here this is t times, so this was just this part, t times sum over j. And th then I get I T E J applied to F times alpha plus something which is bounded in T. Okay? So if I look at this here, um, then I see this is in fact the wedge multiplication by DF. So this is t times, um, no, no t. Why did I put it? This was this t, so I put this in front, i t. Then I have the wedge multiplication by df of alpha plus, plus a big O of 1. Okay, just by seeing that these are the components, this is, um, df applied to ej, or the scalar product ej times df, okay? And therefore, you get this here. And this is the symbol. Um, so the final result from here is that we get i times the wedge multiplication with uh, xi, because df was xi. And this is not elliptic because there are lots of, of size where this um, um, operator is zero. Namely, whenever you have a form which contains the, co the vector xi, um, it's in the kernel of W xi, yeah? the wedge, uh, the, um, ah. wedge multiplication. So <clears throat> this is good. Let's uh, try next. But then we <coughs> can relatively simply see that there's a general rule saying that this is the symbol of d, um, d hat of xi. So this is an endomorphism. And taking the transpose of this, and this we know, this is minus i times the interior multiplication with the gradient. Okay. 
Okay, now we can compute the symbol of the Durham Hodge operator, which is the sum of these two symbols. It's I times um, the wedge multiplication by xi minus the interior multiplication. And this is what we called the Clifford multiplication by the gradient, so to speak. Now the Clifford multiplication is something different because if you multiply it with itself, you get minus C's norm of psi squared or norm of psi uh, sharp squared is the same. And that means this is not invert, uh, this is invertible for all psi which are non-zero. Okay? What is the question? Uh, what is the symbol uh, in oh. the first line uh, after the minus? I, I put this yesterday. So you have Tm isomorphic to T star M, <coughs> uh, which is implied by the metric. Yeah? Okay. The metric does yes. this. Okay, and this I call, um, from here I go down, and from here I go up. Oh, yes. this, this, yeah, this is a, it's the interior multiplication. So, no, what, what is the symbol? Is this an R, I? Psi. Psi. No. <laughs> <laughs> Which symbol? This here? <laughs> this one? Psi and the I. No, no, no. To the left, R. To the right. R. Between them. <laughs> here is an I, yeah? <laughs> Which is the square root of minus one. This is interior multiplication. This is the vector psi, the co-vector, and this is the isomorphism which puts it into the tangent space. The letters may be yoda. Maybe that's the question. The letters for the interior multiplication is yoda. No, it's an I. Yeah. I from I mean I from interior. Maybe I should <laughs> do this <laughs> in order to keep this and uh, the W means wedge, yeah? wedge multiplication, interior multiplication. I mean, it, um, many people write, for example, X, which is a nasty symbol if you want to work with operators. Yeah? This is not a good operator symbol. And otherwise, they would do uh, alpha wedge. Yeah, but this is not, um, not good. Anyway, this is just notation. Nothing substantial, yeah? but notation must be correct. I understand this fully, and therefore I leave out something every now and then, and fortunately I have somebody to watch me. <laughs> okay, so we have this, and this is an elliptic operator. This is extremely important. And the most important uh, property of elliptic operators is so take uh, u in the domain of d star. I do all this uh, in the concrete examples. Uh, u. Um, is in our Hilbert space. And let's say the support is compact in order to not to be tied to a compact manifold. So then d star u, this is a square integrable form again, but assume that this turns out to be smooth. Then we have u in lambda m.
This is elliptic regularity. So you start with something rather weak. And you know the right-hand side is good. Then this means by the symbolic calculus you can produce a left inverse of d star which maps smooth things to smooth things. This is the secret. And the whole um, calculus is called the pseudo-differential calculus. which was invented in 1965. Next year it becomes 50 years old. So, but, I mean, this is only to give you a feeling for uh, the kind of machinery and difficulty which lies behind this. And you can measure regularity with, now back to the case <coughs> M-compact. With um, the domains of deep closure to the K. Now these domains become smaller and smaller. And they are more, the elements in the domains are more and more regular. So the intersection of all these domains is the smooth forms. And this is uh, what you do in order to prove, for example, in the compact case, um, we have essential self-adjoinness. So this is a, a theorem. D bar equals D star star. Um, I, and this again equals D star, which is the same as the adjoint of the closure. And the same, and this is a definition. D is essentially self-adjoint, <coughs> meaning that the closure, the most natural object you can form, the smallest closed operator is already self-adjoint. Yeah, so that's what the physicists like. They need not care about boundary conditions whatsoever. They can just compute. And all these computations are actually justified. Likewise, so you have various ways to to write this. So next thing is um, we want to understand the spectrum of D. Well, it's, uh, I put always the bar and not in order not to confuse you. D is just the differential operator on lambda m, and D closure is the, operator, the closed operator acting in the, the L2 space. So what about D? Now we want, we want of course, by what we have done yesterday, that the spectrum of D bar equals the discrete spectrum. Which implies, this is something we have not touched upon, the discrete spectrum is called discrete because it is a discrete set. Each 
element of the set is an eigenvalue of finite multiplicity. And the discreteness means there's no cluster point anywhere in the finite area, even though this could happen in general. The only accumulation points are plus and minus infinity. Okay. So, uh, spec, if this is true, consists only of isolated eigenvalues with finite multiplicity. And all eigen eigenforms, I should say, all eigenforms, not eigenfunctions, are in lambda m. So that means they are smooth forms. So why is that? Why are the eigenforms smooth? What do you think? Well, this is elliptic regularity, yeah? So d star minus lambda u is d minus lambda u star, because lambda is real. And this is equal to zero. So u must be equal to zero. Uh, u must be smooth, sorry. This is, and <clears throat> this means we can work as we were in, a, in the matrix case. Yeah? Only we have to take care of the fact that there are infinitely many eigenvalues and eigenforms, but everybody knows how to handle this. It's just infinite series. It's uh, extremely beautiful. Yeah? So, well, there's one thing I should also mention here. Note that spec d bar is symmetric around zero. So if lambda n is in the spectrum, also minus lambda n is in the spectrum, with the same multiplicity. So this is what one usually means by this phrase. Since the reason is the same, which we have encountered already several times, epsilon d bar plus d bar epsilon is equal to zero. So epsilon maps the eigenspace of eigenvalue lambda to the eigenspace of eigenvalue minus lambda. Beautifully symmetric. Yeah, so this is the tool which we really need. And of course, we should need it in non-compact situations. So this is, um, in fact, a formidable apparatus. It's um, well known in certain parts of the mathematical community so that it's regarded to be trivial, but it is not. But it's a beautiful and very useful result. Where is this machine to? There it is not to ride in the water. So now we can take a rest, uh, lean back, and contemplate what we have done. Because after all, we want to understand singular spaces. and. Uh, we use spectral theory as a tool to derive invariance of spaces. First of all, only in the simple case of uh, compact manifolds. 
And how do we do it? So what can we learn from I mean, the most information is gotten from the spectrum of delta, which of course has the same um, structure, basic structure as the spectrum of D, because by the spectral theorem, the eigenvalues are just the squares of the eigenvalues of D, and the eigenforms are the same. Right? Apply the operator D twice, you get lambda squared. That is the spectral theorem. So the first thing, and this uh, Marcus has um, explained somewhat yesterday, is that we, we can see the cohomology in this compact. Don't forget this M compact. We can see the cohomology. How can we do this? So we have the Durham complex. Um, uh, let, let me write it like this, lambda 0, lambda 1, lambda m goes to 0. And we know already that the Durham cohomology groups, which are we write like this, is the kernel of di divided by the image of di minus 1. And the Ram's uh, theorem tells us that this is isomorphic to the i's singular cohomology group with real coefficients, and uh, the isomorphism is fairly obvious. So you take an omega here and integrate it over some uh, k-cycle, let's say C, um, ci, omega in kernel of di. And this gives the pairing because it does only depend on the a class of omega in terms of the Stokes theorem. And um, it is um, so omega, or the pair omega C is mapped to this here, which is a real number. <coughs> There's only one difficulty in this uh, approach. In uh, the singular theory, this is a continuous cycle. But here, it must be a smooth cycle. <clears throat> and so you have to make some approximation, which makes this proof really <clears throat> a little bit tedious, whether, uh, even though the idea is clear. Yeah? <clears throat> OK, so that means <clears throat> the Betty numbers um, are known. from D alone. Now you may say, OK, that's a smooth invariant, which doesn't need a metric, so there's no spectral theory here. No spectral theory at all. But um, this can be remedied by the Hodge theorem. which says that the, the kernel of the self-adjoint Laplacian, where this is actually, if you know elliptic regularity, you can actually forget this, is isomorphic to the Durham and therefore to the singular cohomology groups. And um, you may wonder, how actually does this occur? And uh, one way to see this
is to look at this uh, Durham complex again and then to say, I mean, from the point of view of operator theory, we would rather like to have something with Hilbert spaces and closed operators. So we could um, form a Hilbert complex Then, of course, you cannot write the, the Hilbert space there, but you write the domain of D0 bar to the domain B1 bar to the domain of Dm minus 1 bar to 0. And you write here the corresponding bars. Yeah. Um. Well, this goes to the domain of the of zero. Yeah, this is the whole space. And uh, it's not uh, difficult to see that. D i bar of the domain of D i bar is contained in the domain of D i plus one bar. And also, <coughs> so that makes this uh, composition well defined and it remains zero. Now yet you can uh, describe uh, such a complex which you could also write as um, a closed operator d bar in um, L2 of M with the property d bar squared equal to zero and this gives you um, a Hodge decomposition this is exactly as you would do this in the smooth case actually very simple this Hilbert space can be written as follows it's isomorphic to the kernel of this D bar intersected with the kernel of its adjoint this actually is D transpose bar plus the image of D bar closed plus the image of D bar star closed. And then these are naturally isomorphic to the kernel of d bar divided by the image of d bar. Now you forget about the grades. And this, of course, is isomorphic to the cohomology, to h star of this, uh, let me put here an L2 thing, which is really the L2 cohomology, which Marcus has already, the L2 cohomology on a compact manifold which coincides with all the others. And now if you write d bar equal d bar plus d plus bar then it follows that the kernel of d bar is the kernel of d bar intersected with the kernel of d and then you get this. Um, so then the kernel, um, the kernel of d bar is also the kernel of its square. This is also easy to see. And then the Hodge theorem is proved. And you have a, a rather nice tool because on any manifold you can do something like this. You take the closure, but there are many other closed extensions of d in general 
which form such a complex. So you get various kinds of interesting cohomologies. Yeah, so I'm, I always see a compact manifold in front of me, but I think all the time of non-compact ones. So this is something you can do non-compactly, and then you see why this is a spectral result. Because you can say the cohomology of the compact manifold is isomorphic to the kernel with a given Z grading, or Z plus grading. Yeah, so this is nice, but this is only a first step. So this is very elementary spectral theory because we consider only the kernel. How to get more? Well, there is this um, idea of Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization, which some of you will know, right? No? It's old. It's not in the books anymore. But this idea says that if I have um, an, an uh, elliptic operator, let's say on a compact manifold, then the eigenvalues, the number of eigenvalues, less than t. So these are the bound states up to a certain energy are really proportional to the volume of the, the cotangent space. So this is the symbol, let's say, P of psi with the, the standard volume dx d psi. This is roughly the number of eigenvalues less or equal to t. If you regard eigenvalues as, as arising from quantizing a Hamiltonian system, let's say. And the Hamiltonian system in, for the Laplacian would just be the geodesic flow, right? So this is a, um, an idea for, of the Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization from the very early days. which gives an, a set of rules for how to find the bound states. But what is it uh, now concretely? This is actually true. And we do this for the Laplacian because you can count the eigenvalues from zero to infinity. Otherwise, you have to count in two directions. It's a little <coughs> nasty. So n delta bar of t is equal to the sum over all lambda which are less than t, greater or equal to zero. And we put here the, the dimension of the eigenspace. So this is <coughs> justifiedly called the counting number, ca counting function of eigenvalues with multiplicity, obviously. And then one can show in our setting for a compact manifold, that the counting function behaves asymptotically. So I hope this symbol is known. That means uh, it really is the first term I write plus something of lower order. So if I divide by the leading power, then it goes to zero. So this is um, a universal constant depending on the dimension times the volume of the manifold, wall m, in the metric g times t to the m over 2 the dimension. Yeah? 
This is um, normally called Wilde's law. because this was one of the first theorems Hermann Weyl proved, answering a question of Hendrik Lorenz, <coughs> who gave the Wolfscale lectures in Göttingen in 1911. And for the, the theory of the black body radiation, you need to know <coughs> that the um, partition of radiation is independent of the way you uh, decompose the domain. And this is exactly what you need. This is what he asked. Is it true that we have such a relationship asymptotically? And Hilbert said immediately, this will not be proved in my lifetime. This was one of his mistakes because Weil proved it three months later. I was very young that. And then uh, this um, is actually true. It's, the proof is... Um, also not so simple, but in a way straightforward, because the methods are very well known. Namely, what you do is you look at the trace of the heat operator. So first of all, this operator does not make any trouble for us anymore, because we define it by the spectral theorem. And what is the trace? Well, the trace is you take this operator and take all the eigenfunctions, um, how should I call them? Let's say alpha j, and you sum this. Yeah? Well, the eigenfunctions replace the delta here by lambda j. And we know that lambda j increases rapidly, so this will converge because the, um, we know the total number of uh, eigenvalues up to t from this uh, formula. So this is finite. And then we can write this a little better. This is just... Uh, the sum over all lambda in the spectrum e to the minus t lambda. Because now I count with multiplicities. Uh, if I do not do this, I write here the m uh, delta bar of lambda. So this is more correct. This is the trace of the heat kernel. And the amazing thing, really amazing thing, is that this has an asymptotic expansion in powers of t. So this traditionally is written like this. So not just one power, but all powers of t arise here. And this is kind of a miracle and you want to know why this is true. And um, let me just give you some intuitive intuition because we cannot do more than that <coughs> here, but we, um, this is very carefully written down in the book I wrote probably here somewhere, in this book. It contains all the modern information on the heat kernel and its properties. So look at this operator e to the minus t delta and now let's take delta zero um, in Rm. Then you know if you ever heard a little bit about um, partial differential equations, and you know that this is actually an integral operator applied, let's say, to a function s at the point x equals 1 over 4 pi t to the m over 2. That's the one which occurs there. Then an integral over all of Rm 
e to the minus x minus y squared divided by 4t s of y dy. And this object is called the heat kernel. And the trace is, so to speak, the integral of this over the diagonal, and this term disappears, so it's just this. So now on a Riemannian manifold, you can uh, choose coordinates in such a way that at any given point, the, co the metric tensor is the Euclidean tensor and the derivatives of the metric coefficients are all zero at that point. And therefore you could say, well, it is not unlikely that in general, so we are quite daring now, we take the full D and we, we accept from this intuition that actually we do have a kernel also in the manifold case, that this is something that can be written now in the right coordinates, so let me call these coordinates x and y, and we are based at x, x is fixed, that you find a representation like this. Um, now e to the minus over 4 pi t to the m over 2. And then modifications which are given by some endomorphisms and a correction term to the power t for small t. Now this is an ansatz, so to, so to speak. And you prove this by just plugging this in the operator, dt plus delta. And then you see that you get certain terms which order very nicely according to the power of t. This is the discovery of Adama. This was in the 30s when he was a young guy. And the unpronounceable Minakshi Sundaram And Pleil did this first on a manifold. So this, then you get so-called transport equations, which are ordinary differential equations along the geodesics, which allow you to compute these coefficients. And then, of course, we can write these asymptotics, and then we get this, and then we apply a standard theorem of classical analysis, which of course is not taught anymore, anywhere. It's called the Karamata theorem, which allows from uh, the asymptotic behavior of this uh, heat kernel or Laplace transform to conclude that the original thing also behaves nicely. Yeah? So this is um, standard. And what do we get from this? So all this implies that m equals the dimension of m and the volume can be obtained from the spectrum. I mean, it's just, just the beginning, of course, of a huge industry, which nowadays is called spectral geometry. So one looks at the spectrum of geometric operators, mostly Laplacian type, really Dirac type, and tries to extract more information than just this. And the famous question here, which was actually first posed in 1897, but is now is always called Marcat's question, can one hear the shape of a drum? So if I 
Here somebody play a drum and I can hear all the eigenvalues precisely. Can I describe the, the, the uh, shape of the drum, the geometric structure of the drum? This question is still unsettled, at least for uh, drums with a smooth boundary, the answer is not known. It is very likely that it may be true, but if I take um, a rectangular uh, um, polygonal boundary, then you can make many interesting counterexamples where it's not true. But on the boundary, of course, you have to think about boundary problems. Now, we are, of course, interested in much more complicated um, questions than these. For example, the signature, which we have heard about quite a bit already and for which I have only very little time. But let me just say a few elementary things about this. So we go back to our operator D. Yes? To this formula with the Laplace operator. Yes? Would one get the same numbers? No. No, no. I mean, do you, you can do it with the potential, but then, of course, you change these things. Yes, but the dimension or the volume of the manifold, this would be the same. The leading term is the same, yeah, because the potential is two orders lower. It comes, you feel it only with the first term. But, of course, it's a, an interesting question. Now, you fix the metric and you vary the potential, and then you want to determine the potential from the spectrum. Even this question is, uh, has an answer only in very low dimensions. So this is tricky. Okay, but uh, this will, uh, I will start with this tomorrow. The operator D, um, if M is, is even, so equals zero modulo two, has another involution, anti-commuting involution. involution, which is of extreme importance, uh, omega g is the square root of minus 1 to the power m plus 1 over 2. So if I require this, it's just uh, m, m over 2 um, times now the Clifford multiplications by an oriented basis, just done one after the other, um, EI local oriented orthonormal frame, okay? And then, and it's not difficult to see, D anti-commutes with omega, omega G, which it, do, it does not in odd dimensions, then it commutes. And so, the, the space lambda splits as lambda plus, plus lambda minus, where these are the, um, oh sorry, I should say, that omega G transposed is omega G as an operator on, uh, and uh, omega G squared is equal to one. So it's a, a self-adjoint involution. Uh, the physicists also have a name for this. Who knows it? Um, maybe, this I don't know, so it could be, yeah. Yes, this is. This is what's called the chirality operator. Yeah, this is, so this is uh, probably it's maybe it's not more uh, revealing unless you know that chirality comes from the Greek word for hand, 
means to point the right hand on the left hand. Yeah, so it's the, the Händigkeit in German. So we, we uh, split. This is the plus eigen, one eigenvalue, the minus one eigenvalue, and D um, maps lambda plus to lambda minus and the other way around, and these restrictions are called D minus and D plus. These operators are not self-adjoint, of course, but they have an index. Yeah, so the, the index of D plus is, by definition, the dimension of the kernel minus the dimension of the kernel of the adjoint, and the adjoint happens to be D minus. And this is a certain number. And um, most of the time, this number is zero. Yeah? But if, um, or meant, let's say half of the time, if m is divisible by 4, then it is the signature which Marcus introduced yesterday. And this is uh, relatively easy to verify, if you remember, that the kernel of D is the kernel of delta, so these, th this must be the difference of the dimensions of certain cohomology groups. And this is exactly those in dimension 2K, which uh, then this index equals the signature of M, this famous invariant. <clears throat> well, it's, it's a slightly modified spectral invariant because now we uh, put a weight on the kernel. But uh, of course we would like to obtain by uh, spectrally inspired methods another representation of this, which you also heard yesterday, which is the uh, L class of Nabla G, that means the L class is a polynomial in the curvature defined um, of G, but the curvature, which is a form valued endomorphism, and this form has many degrees, and the highest degree integrates to the L class, and the, the local index theorem tells you how to determine directly the connection between this class and the heat kernel. You know, this is the, um, not strictly speaking, spectral theory, but you need it so that it tells you that you are, are derive this from the asymptotics of the heat kernel itself. Yeah, maybe this is a good point to stop because now I'm ready to ask the question of spaces. Yeah, so we let, I mean, finally you can say uh, we want to understand, understand um, space and maybe space-time by studying certain differential operators which finally reveal the structure of the space. This is the analytic approach. This is not the topological approach. But they are going hand in hand, and this is the, the nice effect. So you, you always find in heat topological arguments here, and then you see that in re very refined questions of topology, you suddenly work with uh, an imitation of a geodesic flow or something. And this, um, so this is a, a very nice um, befruchtung, what is the English word for that? Inspiration is not the right word. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's a very modest way. <laughs> okay, I'll stop here. Any direct questions? Oh, no. No, then we... 
postpone it till later.